I'm going to hand over to you, Kate. Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful to see everybody and um, really good to be joining you and thinking about this really important subject. So uh, lots to, to talk through, lots to think about. And I really like it when people use the chat. So feel free to use that. I'll do my best to keep track of what's in there and uh, be able to answer any questions as we go along. If not, we may have some time at the end. We can answer them then, which would be good as well. So, um, yeah, this subject, motivation, very much close to my heart. Uh, motivational leadership is something that, um, for me, um, kind of feels like you can't have leadership without motivation. But for some reason, I decided you need to, to say it out clearly, because actually there's so many of the leaders that I work with that seem to think that you can do it because you just need to dig deep and push through in order to lead. Um, but what I also find out is that they become less and less effective and they start to burn out. So maybe it wasn't a good idea in the first place. So for me, it comes together. You have to have the motivation in order to lead well. But when you lead well, it also, also motivates. So those two things do sit hand in hand together. Um, why is the mo motivation so important? I um, mean, it is generally, we're gonna talk about it a lot um, through the session, but it's worth, It was when I think about motivation, it reminds me of a time where I really didn't have it at all. Um, and I'm minded to think of, I know we've got a, a, an international, certainly European audience here today, but you may still know this reference, which is the clock at Waterloo Station. I don't know if you've passed through Waterloo Station, I see some of you nodding. Um, iconic clock in Waterloo Station and I'd, I'd come into London and at the beginning of my day and I'd I was in my 20s I'd look up at that clock and I'd be like oh I just wish it was the other end of the day I wish it was seven o'clock in the evening and I was making my way home rather than seven o'clock so half seven in the morning making my way into work I was wishing my life away and I did that for a while and realized that, well, there's clearly no joy in working in that way. There is nothing that is fulfilling about having the hard slog to work. And so I guess that became sort of part of my mission, I guess, to recognize that getting people to love what they do and do what you love is not some sort of catchphrase or something that we can just aspire to have but never reach, but almost it's our right it's our right because when people really do love their work they're able to um, really fulfill um, their their full potential as well so in thinking about what we're going to be covering today uh, absolutely making sure we understand why motivation is so important understanding where we might get it wrong around motivation as well there's quite a few assumptions that get made around it and I'd love to share those with you and maybe you want to share some of your own as well and also making sure that you leave here with ideas about what you can do probably for yourself around your own motivation we can't think um, can't help but think about what we can do with our own motivation but also what you can practically do with your teams as well so um, it's both those yourself and your teams if you're able to listen at both levels good on you if you can only listen at one level fine listen to the recording again and then go back through it um, for, your, for, for the other one so when I think just to sort of get us into the same place um, when I think about motivation there are so many myths um, just put in the chat for me if you use um, something like insights discovery or Myers-Briggs or some sort of psychometric that looks at your behaviors at work maybe you use it with your team you may um, have just done the, the stuff for yourself when you've been coached or what have you just put a yes or a why um, or tell me what you've been using so thank you uh, what you've been using as well so yeah brilliant um, being able to know what those we have got a bit of a mixture going on here with Myers-Briggs. Gallup's an interesting one. Actually, Gallup's interesting because it spans more into motivation than just looking at behavior. So that's an interesting one. But a lot of them, Strengthscope, Myers-Briggs are the ones that I mentioned here, Insights, tend to focus on the behavior side of things. And often what can be said is that, well, you know, we need to do something with our team. Let's go do insights. I've got nothing against insights. I use it all the time. What that will do is it will help you understand the behaviors and what a good day and bad day um, looks like in terms of how people are able to show up. What it won't tell you 
despite there sometimes being a chapter in there about it, it won't tell you what motivates people. Motivation changes with age and stage. Bluntly, it can change like that, but it changes much more quickly than behaviors do. And also we can't tell from somebody's behavior what motivates them. We don't know why they are behaving in that way. And we don't know why they're suddenly gone into bad day behaviors or good day behaviors. We need to understand that motivation bit. So great if you are using insights, as I say, I use it all the time, but use it with the understanding of motivation. And I'll explain more about how to do that as we go through today. So first myth is if we do psychometrics, we've covered it. You haven't, I would suggest. Another myth that we have is that um, really it's it's possible to, as I say, see what motivates somebody from their behavior. You might be able to see that they're motivated, but not even always that, because somebody can be supremely motivated and yet be very still. Somebody else could be hugely active but it's not because they're driven and excited about what's possible, but they're scared stiff if they don't get on with it. So really, is it good motivation or bad motivation that's causing that action? We just need to look behind the, the curtain and understand it a little bit more. So we need to get to grips with what the motivation piece is. Um, other myths can be um, that don't we already do this stuff around motivation because we've got good people strategies in place. We do a lot of work around engagement or employee experience, maybe. Again, my experience is that they tend to be quite top down. Motivation is so individual. It is so much to do with the individual taking responsibility for what drives them, that blanket approaches top down. Don't always add uh, what the individual is, is, is looking for to their role, um, but also you can waste a lot of money because if you're trying to cover everything through the, the blanket approach, some of it's going to be falling on, on barren ground. It's just not going to be helpful. So I'd say there's something that's very much about top up um, in, in being able to understand what motivates people. Um, and the last one I just want to pick up on, and it will be interesting. Um, if you think, I'm going to ask you the question, actually. If you think about what you know about motivation already, and that there's a particular theory that you really like and you really like relying on. I wonder if it's the one that I really like as well. Maybe it's a different one. This is where one of my motivators comes into play because I love learning um, about different models and theories. What motivation theory have you come across over the years that you think, yeah, really like that? That really has held me in good stead. That's one I'm going to keep using. Just tell me which ones you've come across and we'll see what we have in play. I'm just going to look across the chat so we can see. So any theory you really like around motivation that really works for you? I'm impressed, Mark, you can spot Ikigai. <laughs> well done. Yeah, Ikigai's great. Um, motivational Maps is absolutely one of our favorites here in Aspire and, uh, and, and, and within the, the, the clients that I work with. Um, being very purpose-driven, the work around Simon Sinek, really useful, recognizing that, um, you know, when it comes to motivation as well, is it about wants that drive us forward or is it about needs and unfulfilled needs, as Jonathan says, there's that pushes you forward. And good old Maslow, we've got Maslow there. That was the one I was thinking of. I wonder whether Maslow still is so um, pervasive in terms of its usefulness in organisations. It's there, but our thinking is so much more beyond a hierarchy of needs. And what I want to share with you today is how you can use some of the theory of Maslow, but bring it right up to 2023 and make it really useful. Um, and that's through the power of motivational maps, which I'm sure um, we can see um, some of you are already familiar with. So when I think about um, motivation, um, you probably remember this idea of the sort of the pressure curve and on one hand here, you can be in a role and be really bored and frustrated and unfulfilled, like I was in Waterloo Station, going into that job and just feeling, oh, my life, just let the hours go by quickly, please. You can also be in a place where you're really, really passionate about the work 
that you do, so passionate, you just love what you do, driven by purpose maybe, and yet you burn out. How many of you and your team are in that truly happy place? The place that not only does the, do you get motivated to do the work, but you get motivation from the work. So it becomes this sort of self-energizing battery pack that means that you just can keep going without the need to dig deep or push through. I just wonder. So that in terms of where we go into organizations and recognize that, you know, we want people to be in that happy place, but sometimes we recognize we've got those people who are just not happy and bluntly will leave um, or they'll become the dead wood. Or we've got people who are so passionate about what they're doing, but they're not delivering to their full uh, potential because they are worn out. And we have to say, don't we, the last couple of years has meant that it's, it's well, we've, I'm not sure we've really recovered yet, have we, from all that hard slog that we had to go through um, with, with COVID and, and everything else. So something I introduce my teams to and I work with them, and it might be something that you, you might be interested in doing or doing for yourself even, is just drawing up a really simple matrix that looks like this, where we're looking at the difference between when you have high energy, where you turn up, you've got high energy and you can see that people are doing things. So I guess that they're, they're, they are actually um, active versus this one at the bottom, which is low energy. Stuff just isn't getting done. And they're just sort of... <laughs> We then have on this horizontal, the difference between positive emotions, the people we wanna be around, and the negative emotions, which is really tricky, really tricky. So let's just look at those briefly and see what those four boxes represent. And maybe think for yourself, first of all, where you might be, um, and we'll, we'll get into your teams as well. So if somebody is in high energy and positively um, uh, showing up in terms of their emotions, so they're in this box here, high energy and positive emotions, just use the chat for me. What's the sort of words and behaviours you'd expect to see in there? High energy, positive emotion, what sort of thing would you expect to see or what, what would summarise that box for you? What does that look like? So there would be focused output, there would be enthusiasm. What else would there be? They're likely to be fulfilling um, their role. So there may be a high flyer, they're gonna be action orientated, eager to take part. They're gonna be leaning into the difficult conversations. They're gonna be figuring out new and different ways of doing things. They're gonna be creative, they're gonna be innovative. They're gonna be the ones that you want to be able to figure out how to clone uh, and get more of them because they are the words that you're describing here, smiling, positive, outgoing, delivering at pace, creating, productive, all of those wonderful words. Don't we want a team full of those people? So what I say is that that box is around thriving, truly thriving at work. They get energy from their work, their work. they're energized to do their work. It means that their, their energy, which is what motivation is, their energy means that the good day behaviors come out. And that combination delivers great results on an enduring and an ongoing basis. What about if you're still seeing stuff being done? It might be high energy. It might be that's just stuff's being done, but actually it's negative emotions. What's that like? What's it feel like? When you're just feeling really lacking in terms of how you feel about your work. I mean, even just saying the words makes me feel this. <laughs> it's amazing how contagious it is. So yeah, the hard slog, demotivated, frustrated, all of those words that you're coming up with. And, and you may remember what that's like. It might be that you've got members of your team that you know are in that place. For me, it's likely that that's a place of survival. It's surviving because they're still producing they're still showing up. They're still managing to get maybe just the, the, the stuff done, the basic stuff done, their job, work to rope done. But actually it's, it's not leaning in. It's not moving to the next piece. It's not using a discretionary effort. And actually at some point it's gonna stop. 
So what if it goes, if that gets un treated if you like if you if you forget to to spend any time on moving out of that space you don't spend the time and you actually then move down to this place of negative emotion and low energy what's that like so you were just about surviving where do you fall into even worse than what you've just said what's that Looking for the exit, absolutely. We'd like to think they might do actually, in terms of um, you know looking for a way out. You don't want them to stay in that awful place, but hopefully the exit's a positive exit, not a negative one. But it's that word, Sophie. Thank you of burnout. So that that bottom left hand box is burnout. It's where people may have checked out. It's where they're not able to produce anymore. It's where it's you know they're fairly often tearful. They're struggling. They're overwhelmed. They're defensive. Oof not good to be around but not great at all to be in that place so we have some choices here we have some choices because we need to be able to move out of that place surely if people are finding themselves in burnout how do they move to at least surviving and get over to thriving and that's where that last box in here under the the positive emotions but maybe low energy there's another box there what what might be happening where you are not necessarily showing up as much, but you're feeling okay about it. What's that one? Can you imagine what words we might use for what that bit's like? You're feeling okay. You actually got positive emotions around it. You're not producing as much. You're not, there's not necessarily evidence of what you're doing. So yeah, hopeful. You might be getting by, you might be realizing, you might be prioritizing yourself. You might be spending time thinking, actually, what do I need to do in order to get back into that thriving box? You might be reestablishing purpose, thinking, actually, what is my bigger aim here? How do I take care of myself and put my own oxygen mask on first in order to get out of this survival box into the thriver one? You might be tired, absolutely but you're taking the steps to turn that around. In other words, those bad habits that you might have fallen into, you're addressing them front on and you're thinking, what can I do to help myself? So what we're talking about here and something is what I often get my clients to do um, in, in thinking about this is, is you can do it. If you've got those four boxes and you were to think about, I don't know, the last year, where's your beginning place on there? Mark an X on where your beginning place is. And then where have you traveled? over the last year and where have you ended up you might want to do that for yourself I can see you you're doing that are you in a better place or a worse place than you were at the beginning of last year because unless we bring to mind our conscious about where we are in our energy levels and our emotional level can we do anything about it and if you are lucky enough that you have been in the thriving place and you've stayed there, do you know why you've stayed there? Do you know what you have done or what's happened around you in your environment to mean that you've stayed in that survival box? Sorry, in thriving box. Don't want to be in the surviving. You're in the thriving box. If you are in the other side and the surviving and the burnout, and you're not making it over to the other side, is that because you don't know how to do that? Is it because you don't understand what the steps are that you'd need to take? Are you like so many people and actually fairly used to digging deep and pushing through just to still get the results? And you're willing to take the personal hit on that, even though you realise it's time to go into that reviving place or um, certainly taking a little bit of time out from the constant slog. So the that other box was the reviving box when people actually do take the time to think about what they need, think about their, their, their purpose, take a bit of um, uh, uh, perspective on what's needed. When I've done this exercise many, 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 many times over the last, um, certainly the last year, probably 18 months, um, I am surprised how many teams appear when you first walk into the room to be okay 
we want to get on with it. We're, you know, we're here. We're happy to, to be having this team day. And I had one team. I remember the chief exec, it was a, the leadership team. The chief exec was sort of like, it's great. We've got through this really hard time. We've um, they had to take 20% of pay cuts um, within the senior level of the organization, 15% for the rest. They've had massive restructure. A number of people leave. And she was like, oh, yeah. We're out the other side, you know. We've kept our our membership. We've our, we're, we're in a good place, aren't we? Let's get on, you know. Welcome, Kate. On we get with the rest of the day. And I just looked around the room to see her team doing this. They weren't getting eye contact. I wasn't seeing. Yeah, yeah, I'm up for it too. I was seeing. Oh God, I must be the only one who's in this horrible place. How am I going to get through today? Faking it. <laughs> and that's not unusual. It really isn't unusual. Um, but what we do then is we go, right, let's get honest. And we do an exercise that we've just done. And that actually not only meant that the team could be honest about where they were, that chief exec was able to be honest with herself and say, yeah, we can just keep going or we can think about what we need to do to move and to recover and to renew in order to be able to get to the next stage, in order to actually thrive through what we've built now, you know, we've done that. We have done the hard work. We've built this this, this organisation so it can it, it will survive now. But we've got to take care of ourselves, and we can't do this to us again uh, ourselves again. And actually, if we're doing this, what are our teams doing? Yeah. So that's the first thing I would offer you. Um, think about it's called the energy matrix. Think about the energy matrix and and plotting yourself and getting real with your team about where they are. But just being there may not be good enough because you might have to shift people into the into a better space. So that's where we're gonna get into next is actually how do you move people into different places? So before we get into that, I do just need to um, uh, just explain in um, how I see the link between that success of um, being in a place of truly thriving and the words that you used of being highly productive, um, truly able to show up and be creative and innovative and all those great things. So getting the what right, um, having great impact, great outcomes, great results and motivation and skills. And the way we draw that is a little old triangle. And on that triangle, we would place up at the top here, we would place the what. What are the outcomes, impact results that you really do want here? And then we would place to the uh, the left hand side, we'd place the how. And the how are the skills and the behavior, the stuff you might get through Myers-Briggs and, and um, also through insights, also through understanding people's skill sets, their knowledge, their experience. And most often times when we're thinking the outcome we want, the what we want for this team is them to be really productive and really up for this and really, um, you know, th this team really succeeding and being high performers. We look mostly to that behavior place, the how, and we say, right, let's get cracking on, you know, understanding people's behaviors and getting common language in play. Yeah, that's part of it. But the other part, the other part of that triangle is the why bother? It's the motivation. Why bother? Why am I bothering developing those skills, those behaviors? Why am I bothering taking the steps that I need to take? Why am I doing that? There's got to be something in it for me, my motivation. But also, why am I bothering? Why is that outcome important to me? Unless I feel a connection to the behaviors and to the, the what, unless I can see what it means for me, I'm not going to do it. Nothing happens without motivation. Nothing, it just doesn't. So in, in terms of that connection, and by the way, the reason we use why bother, not why, is because if you look at why, we get far too many people who are really, really focused on their why and still burn out because they're not attending to all of their motivators. So for me, motivation yes it speaks to why it's a big motivator most of our clients have have that motivator as one of them but we're saying what are you balancing that with what else needs to be met in order to, for you to be able to, to to thrive it can't just be that you're leaving a legacy there must be something else there that's important okay so what's important here is to then understand well um actually how do we make this distinction uh 
of our motivations so that we know how to feed them. If our work sometimes drains us, how do we feed it? But also how can we plug the bucket so that the motivation doesn't keep seeping out? So how do we do that? Well, we look at it by, by having three um, levels a build uh, in terms of different types of motivators. So at the base, I never used to have to talk about this stuff, but COVID seemed to mess this all up in terms of work and what we used to be able to rely on. <laughs> but at our base, we have perhaps forgotten to think about our basic needs. I can't tell you how many people I have to talk about, how much they're drinking their water, going out, getting some movement, getting the connection that's needed, um, really attending to their basic needs. You might be thinking, why, why, why are we talking about that here? Because far too many people in the teams that I'm working with, and it's not just my teams, it's our, our network, when you talk to them, they're just not attending to their basic needs. And we got used to not doing it for a long time. And we got used to um, just surviving in that place, but it's, it's gonna catch up with us, it is catching up with us. So the basic needs is what makes it possible for you to function. Just function, that's what I'm asking for, is for you to be able to function. And those basic needs are maybe linked to Maslow, you know, actually uh, can be, do I feel safe, et cetera. But it's things like, how much, how much movement do I need through the day for me to feel that I can function? How many days can I go without getting out of this office before it starts in, impeding me in some way. For me, I'm very lucky. I, I look out onto a great big window and I can see the sky. For me, being able to connect with something bigger, the sky will do for me. That's really important. So I can do both of those by going for a walk. If I've got movement and sky by going for a walk, that would be a way of me meeting that basic needs. Um, food is important, but what sort of food? I know yesterday I was delivering and um, just got whatever food they gave me, which was a great big bowl of pasta. Not good for me. <laughs> Should have thought about that ahead of the session and taken something that was going to make me function better rather than later in the afternoon thinking my stomach hurts. Sleep. I know it sounds really basic. Oh, it is really basic here, but we must attend to those things. So it's quite possible that we need to spend some time there because the stuff that we're really going to get onto will be wasted if we don't have that bit shored up. This provides the container for the rest. We need that container full, that basic needs piece understood. So think what your basic needs are, work out to what extent out of 10 they're being met, and then think what can you do to have those met on a more consistent basis? Because that'll make you function better. By the way, if you've got a bad habit, like, no reference to me, uh, maybe watching box sets and kind of numbing yourself with those box sets or maybe thinking I was going to do dry January but no I'll, I'm quite busy I'll do it another time whatever those bad habits normally mean that you've got some unmet needs and you're trying to fill it with bad habits won't work <laughs> it's okay to watch box sets if you're fully present for them by the way <laughs> there's some great ones uh, it's okay to drink if you're doing it consciously so the next level, if we've gone from functioning, what makes it possible to function, what makes it possible for you to work, we then go up to the next level, which is your sort of work needs. Now, a need is something that you need. It's about something that can be met enough. Enough of. So I know that I need enough connection, enough recognition, enough money, um, enough sense of control there's an enoughness about those have more of them either they're a waste <laughs> or a start not necessary I it can feel a bit constraining if I get too much connection I can start constraining some of my other actual higher motivators so thinking about what those middling motivators might be I'm going to come back to what some of those are but you might already know what some of them are just from what me talking to you what these do is it makes work acceptable. It's like, yeah, it's okay. It's an okay job. Okay doing this. I'm okay. It's fine. 
but we want more than that, don't we? So beyond work needs, we have our top box, which is work wants. Our work wants. And our wants, because we want them, we want more and more and more of them. It's almost like as we get a taste of it, we want more and more of it because in getting a taste of it, you really understand what it can give you. So I know that my work wants include things like freedom, independence, that, that piece, which in motivational maps world, for those familiar with it, is spirit. You know, I'm heavily driven by spirit. So for me, having a role that means I have no two weeks the same, no two days the same, um, that I'm free to control my diary, that I feel able to do exactly what I want with the, the, the work that I do, um, is huge. It drives me more and more. There are some derailers attached to it, but in terms of what drives me, spirit is really high. I mentioned searcher, which is about purpose earlier. That's really important as well. For me, I need to know what I do makes a difference. So I'm going to look for work and I'm going to want to make more and more of a difference, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to just share with you, um, I don't know if you'll be able to read it. Let's see if you can, if I put them up here and do them one at a, a few at a time. Just fold them up so we've got them, so you can see them on here. Um, it, when you're thinking about your what what your needs are versus wants, try and have that distinction in your mind. Which of these, if any of them, shout out to you? Just go through them um, quickly with you. Then we'll, I'll ask you some questions. Is it about this um, this one down here, which is about making a difference, doing things that are worthwhile? Is that really important to you, or oh, not really? Do you want to know you're making a difference? Do you want to know that you contribute? Where is that in the ranking? Or spirit, this middle one here, is it around um, autonomy, independence? How much do you value your freedom? How much do you want more of that? Or is there an enoughness about it? And then creator, how much do you like variety? How much do you like coming up with new ideas, problem solving? generating new ways of doing things. We then in this middle category have expert. So expert is around things like you know, loving learning, loving being able to um, apply your learning, share your learning, loving being a specialist in what you do. Does that sound like you or is there a bit of a in enoughness about it? Builder in here is around money. Is money something that drives you? Do you love the smell of money? What it affords you? What having more and more of it? Are you quite competitive? And then director at the top there. Do you like being in control of others? Do you like making things happen? Do you like taking decisions? Is that you? And then the last grouping. Don't worry about the colours. Don't worry about the, the groupings. It doesn't matter. Um, star. To what extent do you like to be in the limelight? Do you like to get at the accolades, the rewards, the awards, to be uh, having people say, yeah, Kate did that. How important is that for you? So it can be really important. Um, friend, connection, belonging. How important is it for you to feel like you really belong? And then last, but definitely not least, defender, which is around security predictability, stability. How important is it for you to feel stable in what you do? Is it a need? I can get enough of it, thank you very much. Or is it a driver? Oh yes, that's number one. I need to know absolutely what I'm doing today. I need to know that I've got work in the diary for the next six months. I need to know exactly what processes we're following. Is it a need or a want? Just based on that, just for curiosity, just give me a sense of, um, what have we got here? Do you know what, what would be driving you? What might be in, I don't know, your top three of your, your, your work wants, that top of the place where work is really enjoyable. When you're in that work is enjoyable, I've got my work wants. What are those work wants for you? I'd say mine's um, freedom, uh, making a difference, and mine's also creativity, love coming up with new ideas. They would be my three. What have you got? Have a look and see what we've got. <laughs> Developing people, creator freedom, 
being that direct the person who's in charge purpose variety making a difference fun 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 i don't know if fun sits on here simon it's on there somewhere but fun 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 is definitely uh important to you belonging impact can you see they're also different you just from this group here asking people they're all so different and actually i've given you a bit of language around it um some of you are using that language some of you are coming up with your own it, if you're um, a leader in a team trying to figure out what motivates people i would say actually is really difficult so guessing it i wouldn't bother uh then eliciting it can be quite useful so i'll talk to you in a second about how you can elicit how you can can ask questions to find this out in other people um that can be quite good but we definitely need a shared language around it and that's for those who are using the the language here motivational maps is a fabulous tool for being able to use um to, to get common language so i know that you spy use that um and, and have done for some time um it's a really great way of being able to accurately diagnose what motivates you and the extent to which you're motivated and of course you can do that for yourself you can do it for your team wouldn't it be useful that you know that for your team and that's another myth by the way people think that motivation isn't measurable this tool been using it for 16 years it really does uh, give you a measure it gives you uh, a really good high understanding of what what um, what drives you and it creates that common language so i'd really encourage you if you don't use maps already to use it but hopefully what you can see is if you were to use maps, actually, how can you apply it by thinking about, well, the basic needs aren't mentioned in, in maps, but maybe they you need to do some work on that because you can do all the work in the world on maps. But if somebody is on the floor, they need to pick them, they need the, the work to pick them up first. And that can be the whole team to do that basic needs first. Motivational maps. There are nine motivators in there. The top three are definitely the work wants. The other six fall probably more towards the needs certain the bottom ones do. And so you suddenly you're using the whole map, not just the top ones. It's really useful. So really important to be able to look at that question there. How do you measure motivation? One is using motivational maps. It's about being able to identify the intensity of, you know, these are the, the, the descriptors, you know, how important are each of these. It's not just ranking them one to nine. It's like, yeah, but how how would you score that top one as being important? And, and a tool like um, Maps does that for you. So it tells you the rank order and the intensity gives you a score. But it also does a great thing, which is it measures the extent to which you're motivated. And that's done through some very simple statements that evoke the emotion that says, actually, do I feel this? Do I feel that this motivator is being met and it does that in a fairly simple but really accurate way and that gives you a measure and once you've got a measure you can monitor once you can monitor you can maximize so this you know if we recognize that motivation by having our motivation in play by being fully fueled up and knowing that we can keep the the the, um, the fuel in the engine it means that we can better rely on the, the behaviors we're looking for from our teams but both of those enable, on our triangle again here, enable those outcomes that we're looking for. Actually, if we understand people's motivators, we'll also know what success looks like too. So rather than um, trying to sort of sell people your change, you'll actually be able to inform it through what people are telling you is important to them. Um, and you'll be able to put it in their language or indeed get their own ideas. So what we have here is, um, you know, this hierarchy of, of motivators. Um, I would encourage you to think about the extent to which those motivators are being met. But you might be still stuck on, and I wouldn't blame you for this at all. Um, I think this is, a, is, is where we do get stuck on. Yeah, but if I'm working with somebody, yes, I could, you know, come up with some language like this um, and get them to sort of point to what they think, like I've just done with you, what they think their top three is, their middling ones, um, et cetera, on motivation. But there are some really good questions you can ask um, just to get you started. Bluntly, I'd use maps, but to get you started, um, it's it's these are useful. So here we go. Don't ask what motivates you because often what that evokes is, I haven't had a pay work rise for a while, this is my opportunity. I'm going for it. I want to pay rise. It's just what we do. It also evokes what the cultural norm is 
what I think I should be saying. So I work quite a lot in the charity sector. And if I ask some of the people in there what motivates them, I think they would say, oh, it's purpose, etc. cetera. Um, but actually, it, it, it's absolutely fine for it to be builder, the money one. Because if that's what motivates you, great. But culturally, they might not feel they can admit it. So that's why um, asking the question straight out is quite tricky. Plus, people don't know. 70% of the people that we ask don't know what motivates them from top to bottom. They just don't know. Not really thought about it enough. Not being able to rank them in, in the, the order of the nine. Just can't do it. So the questions we do ask um, are things like, what is it that you truly enjoy about your work? that you look forward to, that you wish you could have more and more of? So that question is, what do you truly enjoy about your work that you wish you could have more and more of? And what that does is it gets them starting to think about the sort of, um, maybe some specific things they enjoy doing, but ask it again or ask, what else? What else? Tell me a few more things that you just really love. And you'll know through asking that question when they are sounding, oh, I just love it when, to, yeah, I quite like it when, because um, you want the energy behind it. Okay, so when they've, they've given you a few answers where you can hear the passion, you can hear the absolute energy in terms of what they've, they've suggested. Then it's about taking that possibly specific example, might like be, like here, you know, why, what do you love doing? I love, I love um, coming along and, and um, presenting this sort of stuff with a group of people. I love doing this, love it. Now I could presume why that is the case, which isn't that helpful. Instead, we need to ask the question. So the next question is, what is it about that that's important to you? What is it about that that is important to you? And then they would say, oh, yeah, well, the reason I love doing this sort of thing is because actually it's easy just to show up and do, you know, it's 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 sort of like easy to fit into my diary. So I, I quite like the freedom it gives me. I don't need to go anywhere. Um, I love being able to play with some ideas. I love the creativity of the ideas that it brings. And I hope it I hope it helps somebody actually it quite matters to me that it helps people. So I'm starting to get some words in play there. And then we could look to another example of things that I do. I was out yesterday with a client, uh, which has been finishing a delivery of a leadership program, uh, a lot of work. What is it that I've loved about that is the amount of iteration that we've had to do through the program and just being able to go with it, go with where they're going. That creativity of being able to sort of bring in what I thought would be useful in the moment. I love that as opposed to a pre-planned program where we're going through like this. Just love that, it's the creativity again. So can you see if you ask that question a couple of times and you get the answers of what they specifically like doing or love doing, and then so what is it about that? You can start reducing it to maybe some language like this, which can be helpful. Um, and that gives you the specific motivators. So that might help you in, in eliciting the motivators and, and then being able to then ask the next question, which is if these are your, are your top three motivators, um, if you were just to guess out of 10, how well are they being met right now? Seven. Okay, seven. What does seven mean for you? What's happening to make it a seven? What are the ingredients that make it a seven right now? Versus a six. Um, and they get more in touch with what those things might be. It's actually, it's, uh, what I really like about it is it's the type of client that I work with. So what type of client does it need to be? Or it needs to be one that I can see what they do makes a difference, okay? So you need to make sure that you do work for clients that make a difference. Um, and then you can say, okay, so what might make it maybe an eight out of 10 for you? Is it, the, you're having it met even more going forwards. Well, I know the work makes a difference, but I don't always get the feedback. So maybe I could do with getting a bit more feedback from people so I can actually see it makes a difference. I know what that organization does, but I don't know what I'm doing to help that organization do it even better. So I, I kind of would like that bit. Okay, so we need to make sure you get more feedback from the clients. So that's what we can do. 
to be able to elicit motivation. But like I said, all of that's done within maps. That's nice and easy. And what you can do then if you're working with a team, which I know most of you, you here do, is that you've got, uh, we've got a number of things in play. Let's do this by way of summary. What we've got is an understanding of why motivation is important. Being able to maybe draw that triangle and think about, you know, what are the outcomes, impact results that we're getting as a team? How do we do that in terms of behavior? But why do we do that? Why do we bother doing that? What's fire fueling our, our engines? What's driving us? And they might come up with some words and that's great. But let's get more specific because this is an individual thing. Let's get more specific. Let's focus on actually, let's just check we've got those basic needs met. Are we attending to those things that we often take for granted, but have been a bit mucked up by the way in which we now work? What are those real basic things that make you function versus the next group of things that make work kind of okay? Got to have those. If they don't, it's a bit annoying if you don't have them and I'll get distracted by them versus, yeah, I just love, I want more and more of those. Let's get some distinction on those and they may be able to come up with some answers for you. And if they can, that's great. Or you might need to prompt them a little bit more in one-to-one -one sessions maybe by eliciting using those questions that I said, uh, to try and get some specificity around uh, what motivates people. But make sure you do ask the extent to which they're being met, what that number means for them, and what specifically the ingredients are. Because once you know what happens is, going back to our original point with the, the NG matrix, is that if they are in a surviving place and they want to move over to reviving or thriving, they need to be able to articulate what they need to do more of in order to get the energy. Just saying I want to be more motivated is not going to cut it. So is it a basic need that needs to be attended to? Is it a, a, a work need? And those annoyances, I don't get enough of that. Or is it a work want that they're really wanting at that point? That's going to shift them over to the other place. Because they are now thinking, I can't just keep going and survive. It's like running on empty. I'm going to pull into this, like this, into this petrol station. I'm going to consider which of these pumps is the one that's going to refuel me. And that's the one that I'm going to select. They're doing it with conscious knowledge. And then because you've, um, you understand them in these areas and they've got the, the, the motivations and, and the extent to which they're met, you're going to be able to keep monitoring and measuring it. And you're going to be able to know the whole person, not just the output of that, which are the behaviours. So I hope you have found that useful. I'd be really interested in some questions if you have them. Um, and um, you know, sort of get a sense of really what's landing for you, where do you need more information? Um, really, how can you make sure that motivation isn't the sort of leave it to happen stance piece that it has so often been? Well, look, actually, and thank you. Thank, first of all, Kate, before we, uh, I think we've got a couple of minutes for some questions. I just wanted to say thank you for your energy <laughs> because we can hear it. We can, we can sense that this motivates you, actually helping other teams get motivated. And, and certainly we have first experience of you working with many of the teams and customers we work with. So thank you for that energy. Uh, we have got a couple of minutes, um, and, and I think also we've got a promotion which Kate has organised, which we'll drop into the chat in a second. Are there any questions? If there are, please uh, um, feel free to put your hand up and then we'll uh, get you off mute and, and to ask. We've got a couple of minutes. Anybody got any questions that they want to ask Kate before we wrap up today? If you're not comfortable talking, you can I always drop them into into chat as well okay why does one person especially um if poor me so badly impact on the rest because motivation is contagious um uh, jonathan just said that you 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 can feel my motivation high energy you can feel bad energy as well you know if somebody's sitting there in a slump even me talking about being in that surviving place earlier your energy would have gone mm. let alone sitting next to somebody who is that is embodying that so it's really important to this is why it's so important that if you've got somebody on your team where motivation is low don't think well they're you know leave them over there they'll be fine they're contagious so we need to understand what's going on for them most definitely um 
how much of motivation should come from the individual rather than from someone else um motivation the responsibility for one's motivation is your own only you truly know how you feel and what's really going on inside of you uh what a leader does is it provides the environment to make that possible it makes the environment to even talk about it makes the environment to be able to have ready-made um, solutions potentially um but it uh, and also gives the permission to spend time on this stuff so so ultimately it's the individual's responsibility um but we are not an island we often need the help of others to support us in getting those needs met to a, able to articulate them to get the, the self-awareness etc so um it's done in tandem but ultimately it's your own responsibility um for sure but um yeah you can't make somebody be motivated um does being an introvert versus an extrovert change anything do we work with them on motivation in different ways great question um you will see it in them differently you know somebody who's like tigger um running around all excited um is more likely um to be on the extroverted side but we don't know whether they're more motivated than somebody very contained getting on with their work who may be on the introversion side so we can't presume it so in terms of what assumptions we make about it maybe um we need to check that there's good reason to check it um but in terms of how we deal with it um motivation is quite personal um so you might want to to uh, do it more one-to-one -one with introversion to sort of try and pull it through and pull it out uh whereas with extroversion they might be quite happy talking it out um loud and together um but ultimately no matter what in any of this it's about using good coaching questions to enable the individual to be able to identify what drives them times where they've been really motivated and not and what they want to happen to change that to be even higher or keep it at the same level because it's already high um so the the way you interact with them would be different but it, it's ultimately their responsibility um uh, oh good questions i don't know much time we've got uh, best number one inspirational reading on motivational leadership I could be really facetious and say my own book. <laughs> no, you should actually, by the way, you should plug that. We had that conversation earlier. So oh, take yeah. the opportunity. Take the opportunity. That's my one. So create motivation, unlock the leader within talks all about this. Very readable. I don't do big words. Um, it's a workbook effectively it takes you through um 200 pages. So um create motivation. How can people get a copy of that? So Amazon. Easily? Yeah, Amazon. Yeah. Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. On Amazon. So just put my name in and create motivation. It'll come up. Um, so yeah. Um, <laughs> easy plug. Thank you for that. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, and um, yeah. Um, how to make difficult to work with people, very opinionated, think they know best and accept responsibility. Oh, how long you got? Uh, <laughs> motivation comes from within. Are they, are, it, it really goes back to working alongside. Be really interested in them. They might be the most annoying person on the planet, as far as you're concerned right now, but you learn most from your difficult people. So um, sit to the side, start to understand, and don't let their negative motivation infect you, but do offer the environment that they can take the steps themselves. Brilliant, Kate. Well, look, first of all, can I say thank you to you uh, for, as I said, your energy, but also sharing all those insights and asking those questions at the end. Uh, Chris has dropped uh, a few things into the chat. So just if you've got a couple of minutes. Kate's book is in there, so you can click on the link. Yeah. Well done, Chris. That was uh, very quick off the mark there. So um, with, there's also a, a link for the promotion. Um, which uh, uh, which is based on an individual emotional motivational map. Uh, which is discounted there's a there's a discount code and i think kate and i we, we are going to work up something for a team which will 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 follow on we didn't have a chance to do it before today so uh kate's offering a promotion for uh, a team of up to 12 people i think and uh, yeah. again that's discounted price but we'll more on that later um uh so thank you all for joining i'm conscious you've all got teams to get back to hopefully today you it's the beginning of your journey both from a personal motivation, but also to consider what motivates your team and how to get the best out of them. We wish you uh, an enjoyable rest of, of Thursday. And if you get a chance, do, do, get, do get a copy of Kate's book and, and give it a good read.
Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next Discovery event. Take care.